Hi, uh, thank you everyone for coming today. Uh, my name is Berta and I'm an old student of uh, John Moore's. I was um, a student here. I did my degree and diploma uh, from 1998 to 2004, which feels like ages ago. Um, I'm here because I believe architects add tremendous value to buildings. I believe half of the property development industry would not exist if it wasn't for us. And that's not just because then there would be nobody to build the buildings or, or even worse, only engineers and contractors would build them. Um, but also because our profession creates concepts and products that enable the property development industry to be really diverse. Oh, sorry. There we go. Um, I think our profession has been massively, massively devalued over the years and architects don't get what they deserve out of the development process. So what I'm going to talk about is how we take this value back. But first I just want to tell you briefly how I got here. Um, my first architecture job was my year out at Shepard Robson. And after this experience, I realized that unless I wanted to uh, draw toilet details and do hardware schedules for the rest of my life, I would have to excel um, over and above my peers. So I really applied myself during diploma. I gradu graduated with a distinction and I moved to Manchester to work at uh, Ian Simpson Architects. I was there for two years, but I didn't get to build anything. Uh, so I moved to London and I went to work at Studio Edgar West. I was another year there, I didn't get to build anything. So then I went to, I moved again, I went to AHMM and I struck gold. I was put on the angel building team, I was started drawing stairs and I worked my way through the building. I worked on nearly every package in the building from cladding to reception to rug design. The construction was not without its hiccups, um, but the contractor wanted the best result possible, and they cooperated at every opportunity to get the best building. It's, it was really one of those rare occasions where you know, the planets align and everyone is just looking after the project selflessly. Uh, the project was nominated for the Sterling Prize and became a great success and I truly felt on top of the world. Um, my client, Derwin London, they were so happy. They took me and the team for dinner. They bought me a beautiful gift, like a silver and lacquer box. And I spent a, a few months basking in the glory of the Angel Building. So I was still in cloud nine when they gave me my next project, 10 New Burlington Street for the Crown Estate. I was elated because I had been asking to be put on this project for ages. And you know, it was a big budget project with a very prestigious client. And this project I would be running myself under supervision from one of the associate directors. I had a team of seven during the most intense period uh, doing the construction set of drawings. And I was doing a bit of everything, you know, design, project management, uh, drawing production, drawing review. I was putting together and giving every single client presentation. I was working insane hours. And as we got deeper into construction, I realized that this project was going to be very tough. Um, the contractor uh, that the client had selected uh, was terrible. They had come in really cheap and that's how we ended up with them. They constantly made mistakes. They were driving me mad. So I started to feel the grind of a project that you have to push uphill. And don't get me wrong, like, you know, slowly things were working out and the building was turning out beautiful. But the process really started to burn me out. I was thinking, when all of this is over, what am I going to get? Another silver box? And where, all, where does all the work and effort and all the fights come out at the other end? I wasn't going to get a bonus, uh, but my client was really going to fill their pockets. 
Um, I saw myself making this beautiful pie and you know, I spent ages on it and I put my life on hold for three whole years so that to make sure that it's perfect. And I feel great because everybody says, what a great pie I'm making. And when I'm done, I take my apron off and I place the pie in front of my clients. And what happens? This happens. And they just give me another batch of ingredients to make another pie. At this point, uh, you can ask my dad who's here. I was going nuts about what to do. I uh, realized that what I wanted was more control over my projects and a piece of the pie. So I thought, I need to become a developer. Hi. Uh, but the thought of becoming a developer was pretty depressing. Uh, you know, was I ready to give up design and construction and get behind a computer crunching numbers? No. So I thought maybe there are developers that are also architects or architects that do development. And I did a bit of research online and I literally came across this article. So, uh, and I realized that there were firms that indeed were architecture and development firms. And you know, most of, most of them were in the US uh, and there were five uh, relatively successful firms in New York. So after 10 years of working as an architect, um, I packed my bags, I put everything I own in storage, and I enrolled in some part-time classes at New York University, finance classes, and I went out there looking for a job. Uh, like, this was no easy task. You know, I sent nearly 300 CVs by the time that I got an offer and uh, the required visa sponsorship. Uh, I moved there nearly three, year, three years ago, and I have worked for uh, two architecture and development firms, and I will tell you a little bit more about them shortly, but first I want to ask you what you think is a developer. I think developers can get a bad rep, and sometimes it's earned. Uh, my first job in New York City was a bit of a nightmare. Despite their background as architects, you know, they were the types of developers that many people think of. Money grabbing, destroying neighborhoods, you know, suing contractors, cheating the consultants. Um, but luckily, not all developers are like that. My current job in New York City is the opposite of that. The company is called Avery Hall Investments, and I was the first employee of the company uh, a year ago. And since my joining, we have grown from four people to 10 people. My bosses are a former architect, a former finance guy, and a former property, property manager. And this is our office, which I designed, hence why I'm showing it to you. Um, we're a, a young firm, um, but we have some very exciting projects in the pipeline and we do all of our design in-house. So we actually have architects employed full-time doing design work. Um, my bosses are not assholes. They genuinely care about the community. Um, they care about design a lot. But obviously they're still trying to make money. So a developer I think the definition is someone that creates value out of buildings. A developer buys, an, buys land, renovates, extends, or builds buildings. So you can call yourself a developer if you buy a house, you got it, you renovate it, and you sell it. You can call yourself a developer if you build a building and you say turn it into private rentals, and you keep the building uh, so that you can, you know, so it gives you monthly money. That's called a cash flowing asset. Depending on which way you go in your career, uh, you will most likely um, end up working for a developer. They will be your clients. And they will determine the fate of your buildings and of your designs. I don't want this to be a depressing thought, so here are a few good examples of buildings commissioned by developers. The top two obviously were nominated for the Sterling Prize. 
Um, and these are winners of RIBA awards. I found a, a, a RIBA award winner here in the Wirral. Well, in the Wirral. And yeah, Eric Parry. I mean, Eric Parry's buildings are a little bit boring. I feel like you're walking through a piece of tofu sometimes. Uh, this is Gloucester Services. I don't know if you've heard the story about Gloucester Services, but I find that this is a great story of entrepreneurship and uh, development. Uh, and, and yeah, the Dunning family, the owners, um, they found out that there was going to be a motorway running through their farmland. So, and they were told that there was going to be a small motorway service area built in their land. So the family talked about it and they decided to have a go. So they built a mini service area with just two pumps, a shop, and a cafe. And they started like by making the food themselves, um, sourcing all the ingredients for, from farms nearby. And their business grew and grew. And in 2013, they bought a parcel of land by the M5. They commissioned Glenn Howells to design a service station, and they built this fantastic building. <coughs> which has become a destination in itself. Like, I mean, who would have thought that a service area could be a destination? <laughs> the, the Dunning family are developers, and they became developers through their business. So there are things that make architects good developers. And these are education. So architects generally learn traits that I think make for better developers than, say, someone with a finance degree. And I just put that cat there to check that you're still awake. Um, this is because you can see opportunities where others with an untrained eye can't. Uh, for example, this is Slender Bender in Berlin. Don't Google Slender Bender on its own, by the way. Um, but it's a firm called Deadline. They're based in Berlin. They bought this narrow site that nobody had any interest in. They just bought it with a mortgage. And they developed it and extended it. And now they manage it as an apartment hotel. And they use this for income, which in turn allows them to be more choosy with the projects that they take on. So they haven't given up architecture. They're just you know, turning architecture into a business. Well, another reason architects make good developers is approach. Architects have design sensibility. You know, they care about natural light, about green space, sustainability, and they know the difference that good architecture can make in communities, in schools, and in people's well-being and behavior. Another thing that makes architects good developers is an understanding of building. Um, you once you build one or two things, you will fairly quickly understand what it takes to build a building. And this is not knowledge that developers generally have. Uh, especially when you are a project architect, uh, you will perform various roles, like you will lead a project team, you will work with contractors uh, you know, on how best to build buildings, you will be maintaining a schedule. This versatility is extremely useful. Good design adds value. Um, I'm not just talking about an architect drawing and redrawing until they find an extra 100 square feet uh, in a building, or you know, creating a new concept for micro tiny apartments so that you can squeeze people in in a small site. But people will always pay extra. They will pay a premium from, for something that is unique and special. Um, a stupid example, but a nice tile can sometimes change a very bland bathroom uh, into something super special. And an apartment with a nice bathroom is going to sell for way more than a plain one. 
Now, throughout this presentation, you're going to hear me talk a lot about residential developments. And this is because I think it's the easiest uh, and the most relatable um, building type when it comes to property development. So last reason I think uh, architects make good developers is that you understand how cities work. Like good, good architects understand the importance of context and the impact that architecture has in cities. And you're more likely to think about a neighborhood and what it needs than a traditional developer would. Um, as such, uh, architects are more likely to reconcile profit making with you know, a, a broader strategy for social change. Um, an example of this, Jonathan Seagal, he was probably one of the first uh, architect developers around. He saw an opportunity in building uh, houses in like uh, suburban infill sites. So he knew uh, the importance of knitting parts of the suburbs together and he found these oddly shaped sites that um, he used to turn uh, his designs into one of a kind houses. You don't have to love his work, but you can appreciate the ambition. Now, what makes architects bad developers? The first one is the obvious one, lack of understanding of business and finance. Now, when I left John Moore's, I felt that I left with a good education. So thank you, gentlemen. Um, but I do wish that I had been taught some business and economics. Um, during my part three, I learned about fees, so how to calculate and price my work. But I still feel this is not enough. And in part, I think this has contributed to the devaluing of the profession. Architects uh, face immense competition from one another, and you will undercut one another. And a developer will go and see two medium-sized firms, both with similar track records uh, of design and experience. And who are they going to pick? They're going to pick the cheapest one. And if they don't, they're going to say to the other architect, why are you charging me more than this other guy? You know, like, I can get this job done for X. And you will have a choice. Lower your fees and make less money, but win the commission or keep your fees and risk losing the commission. Unfortunately, most architects will choose the former. So the architect that wins the commission makes very little money, in turn pays very little money to their employees, and the, the cycle of devaluing the profession goes on. The second reason uh, architects can make bad developers is a lack of understanding of the real estate market. One crucial thing that developers need to be good at is understanding the real estate market. This means knowing where there are plots of land to develop, uh, knowing what type of building would work there from a planning point of view and from a tax point of view. Sometimes you get tax breaks if you put a certain use in a certain location. And also it, knows, it means knowing the timing of your building and what else is going on around you. Like um, the real estate market, like the economy is cyclical, so it goes up and down. So imagine you have a great piece of land and you can build retail and offices on it uh, for a very, very good price. And, but your building is going to take three years to build. So what's happening three years later? You know, may, maybe the market has softened and there's not the necessary demand. Or maybe another building near your site will be complete before you. So keeping your finger on the pulse um, of the real estate market is very crucial. And architects are often not aware enough or, of where the cycle is. The last one is my favorite. putting design above value. And I used to do this all the time with my clients for the Angel Billion and New Burlington Street. I would dig my heels 
for the purity of design, for the German-made bespoke cladding system, for the Danish taps and the expensive finishes. The one that I remember the most is uh, this image. It was the bathrooms in New Burlington Street. Uh, we had this trough arrangement, right, in the bathrooms, which meant that if you were carrying a bag, you had nowhere to put it because you don't want to put it on the floor. So I insisted that we put some hooks under the trough so you can hang your bag from it. And I had to put red circles around it because you can barely see them. I don't think they're getting used at all. Anyway, the point is I insisted and this was a complete shit show. We had to reinforce the supporting frame. Uh, we had to add a carpentry piece that wrapped around the bins. It was a complete waste of money and time. And my client was livid with reason. I would not do this again. Um, architects are often focused solely on design. And there's a general disregard for the financial part of a building. And I think this mindset needs to change. So why do I think that architecture and development firms are the way forward? Um, if there's one thing I, wanna, I want you to take away from this talk today is that the building industry is a business. And you as architects bring tremendous value to this business. And I really want everyone in the architecture, uh, in architecture to get what they deserve out of the business. So if any of you would like to avoid the tyranny of having a client dictating what you can and cannot do, uh, take charge and pioneer this approach of architects and developers, or architects as developers. In particular here in the UK, you will be breaking new ground because not many people have done this before. So go get your piece of the pie. So how do you do this? There are many ways of doing this, and I have split it into small, medium, and large. So small. Um, if you're not up for taking a big risk, um, you know, you can start small, no need to look for sites. You can just uh, play with what you have. So talk to your clients. Would they be open to profit share in exchange for lower fees? Or would they consider a bonus structure in exchange for lower fees? You can say, I can build this building in X amount of months for X amount of money. If I improve the program by one, by one month, I get 3,000 pounds bonus. If I improve it by two months, I get 7,000 bonus. Um, if I save you money, you give me 30% of the money I save you, you keep 70%. As an architect, you're already supposed to always be trying to save time and money to your client. But this kind of arrangement is always done with contractors. They could completion, bon they get completion bonuses uh, when they finish on time. So what you're doing here is sharing the risk. You're getting paid a little less with the incentive of a little extra at the end. And uh, I mean, in construction, there are always variables. So, you know, something that you thought was going to be a certain price, like say steel work, uh, you know, turns out to be way more uh, by the time of construction. Something that you thought was readily available, like windows, uh, now is going to take four months to to make. And this always happens. Um, and oftentimes, these issues are resolved by the architect talking to the contractor and the client. And they both get bonuses, so why don't you? If you lead a project to early completion or you deliver it under budget, you should be rewarded for it. In medium, I'm gonna talk about crowdfunding and co-housing. So crowd, crowdfunding, if you have a project in mind um, that could benefit your local community, you can start a crowdfunding campaign. BR King goals of big raised 30K. Uh, he was aiming for 15,000 to develop a steam ring generator at a Copenhagen power plant. Um, also, the Jennings Hotel 
um, they raised one, over $100,000 to renovate this as hotel and apartments. And the incentives that they offer their backers range from a custom key ring, if you contribute $10, to you can take over the entire hotel for a weekend if you contribute $2,000. Um, so maybe you know that in your neighborhood or your community they need a cafe or a store or a small supermarket. You know, you can start a crowdfunding campaign to buy and refurbish the ground floor of a building, say, which you can then lease or you can sell or you keep it as a cooperative. <coughs> Co-housing. Um, Co-housing involves finding a location where multiple people want to live getting those people together and build a property, which eventually everyone will co-own. This is pro popular in Berlin, and, but it's also spreading to places in other places in Europe and in the US. You as the architect will bring about the required set of skills. So if you're interested in getting an apartment out of it, you can you know, trade in your skills as your, as your equity stake. Co-housing is generally for you know, like-minded folks, like maybe they're interested in sustainable living. And uh, you know, everyone invests uh, a significant amount of capital to, um, to get their, their homes designed. There are co-housing groups online at the moment, if you Google it. Uh, and some of them are interested in finding, you know, architectural professionals to, to take on the role of a designer. Um, I found some in the US, but you know, if there are none in your area, perhaps you can start one by finding a suitable piece of land, you create a design concept, and you organize a group. This uh, building in the screen is a co-housing building, it's in, in Berlin. It's the first seven-story apartment block in the world that was constructed from timber entirely. Um, the stair and the, and the corridors that you can see there, they are the fire escape, which are actually made out of concrete to make sure that you have a safe fire route, fire escape route. Okay, so large. So this is a fully integrated architecture and development firm. So I'm going to tell you here about my top three um, architecture and development offices and their buildings with a focus on four important things, money, sites, construction, and sales. So money. In relation to money, I want to talk about Tamarkin Co. Carrie Tamarkin had been working as an architect for 10 years. Uh, so like me, when he got tired of having no control over his projects and not making enough money. So he went searching for sites. He found a warehouse that had been empty uh, for five years in the West Village. Um, and he made a list of 100 people that he could raise money from. And he worked his way down the list and got very lucky. He came across a guy that was running a real estate fund. The guy made 75% return, which is amazing, and Carrie made nearly $1 million. After that, Carrie did incredibly well. He bought a firehouse that was sold to Anderson Cooper, who is a famous American journalist, and the firehouse was featured in a H&M advert with David Beckham and Kevin Hart, you can see there. And then he bought a couple of sites right next to the High Line in Chelsea, which is that awesome uh, elevated park that was built on the old um, train tracks. This one is uh, 456 West 19th, which is pretty amazing because it features double high living rooms in all the apartments. If you think about it, a greedy developer would build single story and get more apartments that way. Uh, but Carrie knew uh, that this would be very special and that many people would be happy to pay extra for this luxury. This one is uh, 508 West 24th, also by the High Line. I think he took inspiration from Tadao Ando. 
and he used fair face concrete to a surprisingly successful degree. And I mean, I mean, I say surprisingly because the way that they build in the U.S. is truly cowboy style. Um, and then he did Ten Sullivan, which I'm sure you can guess what he took inspiration from. Um, the site was tricky because it was a very narrow junction, very busy. And an average developer would have thought, you know, too risky, like not enough value in this site. So Cary probably got this site uh, a little cheaper than your average Soho piece of land. Um, I'm not saying you have to love this building, but I think, the, I think it's very successful at making the most of the space available. Although you have to buy a round sofa. So Cary got very lucky when it came to finding the money, but you don't need to be rich to develop. You need to find investors and lenders. So every project has one part of equity, so cash, and one part of debt, which is like a loan. So equity is the money that you get from investors to buy the land and to commission you know, your architect, your engineers, uh, to do a planning application. Investors can be any of these that I listed, hedge funds, you know, private equity funds. Or they can just be businesses looking to invest. Like, for example, the w company that I work for, um, we have taken capital from a plumbing business that we used to work with, you know, like selling taps and whatnot. Um, the plumber is a very wealthy guy. He made good money through his business. And, you know, he's looking to grow his money, so he knows my bosses. He has done business with them before. And when they presented him with an investment opportunity, he took it. Investors are not that hard to find. Um, there are people that represent hedge funds that go around scouting for opportunities to invest. The best way to increase your chances of coming across these people is to partner up with someone else, like a finance student or uh, someone, in a, someone in finance. They're closer to that world, so you know, they will have better chances to uh, encounter these investors. Also, real estate agents can be your allies when looking for investors. They often make transactions with people who are buying property as investments. So they get to know what you know, types of buildings and sites uh, they're looking for. The other part is the debt. So once you have the site and you have planning approval and you have a price for your construction, you go to the bank and you ask for a construction loan. And the first loan that you ask for, it was going to be tough. You know, you will need to negotiate a lot. There will be high interest rates and you know, lots of clauses designed to protect the bank and leave you with all the risk if something goes wrong. So you will need a good lawyer and, and a financial advisor. So I'm sure you're probably thinking, oh, God, I have to talk to bankers and real estate agents. Uh, but just remember that. When you're commissioned to design a building, they will be pulling the strings behind the curtain. And so would you not rather be pulling the strings yourself and using them for their knowledge? So if you haven't fallen asleep yet, you're probably thinking, OK, I have to pay back the investor. And I have to pay back the bank. So what am I left with? So the magic word is promote. And you should remember this word. So the rule that we all know is, if I invest 1% of the cost, I get 1% of the profit, right? Well, not with Promote. Promote is an extra share of the upside of a transaction. So let's imagine I'm an investor, and you tell me you're going to build a giant R2D2 out of Lego. And it's going to cost $3 million but you know some nutter that is going to buy it for four million. So this means that the profit is one million dollars or pounds. I think it's a cool idea. I have the money, and but I don't want to get involved in any of the risk that comes with this. You know, if anything goes wrong. So I give you the three million, but I get you in a contract that guarantees that you will pay me six hundred thousand after a certain amount of time, regardless of what happens. 
So off you go. You buy the Lego, you start the project. But guess what? Construction gets complicated, things go wrong, and your construction ends up costing 3.3 million. But you still have to pay me 600,000. You guaranteed me, so you're only left with 100,000. It's a nightmare, right? But now you're obligated to keep going. So you keep going and you get the R2D2 done and you put it in the market and guess what? Some crazy guy offers you four and a half million dollars. So you have made way more than you, that you expected to begin with. So in very, very simple terms, this is how developers make their money. They take other people's money, but they also take all the risk. The investor doesn't care. As long as they get their preferred return, they don't care. You're the one running the show as a developer and juggling to make sure that you get some earnings out of it. So now let's talk about sites. And to talk about sites, I want to talk about a firm that I really like called Alloy. The founders are a businesswoman and an architect. The architect, Jared, he was practicing as an architect for many years. And as a way to generate more work for his firm, he partnered with one of his clients, Catherine McCombie, to buy and develop properties. And after a while, he dissolved the architecture firm and co-founded Alloy with Catherine. They developed mostly in Brooklyn, uh, specifically in an area called Dumbo. Um, this is their latest building, 1 John Street, right by the Manhattan Bridge. Alloy de developed in Dumbo because that is what they know best, and this is really crucial. You always have to stick to what you know. So only ever look for sites in areas that you know really well. And if there are no opportunities in areas that you know well, go and scout new areas, but um, do it until you know them like the palm of your hand. So cycle around them, drive around them, go there in the day and in the night. Like look at how different uh, an area can look uh, depending on the time of day. My, um, my boss, Brian, he spends hours cycling around Brooklyn and Queens, which is where we develop. And uh, he notes like people patterns, age groups, transport links. You know, he looks at where there are offices, where there are houses, where, where the schools are, which one's a good school and a bad school, super important. The green areas, the parking availability. Uh, also, you need to look at the planning policies for these areas. You know, what's selling there at the moment? Again, this is where your best friend is the real estate agent uh, because they have a finger on the pulse. Um, and, but if you can't bear that, just talk to you know, local people and shops and ask what, what is lacking in this area. Like, is it a better supermarket, a community facility? Do they need more one bedrooms or four bedrooms or are they lacking? any kind of outdoor space. So yeah, so Aloy are based in Dumbo and they have done most of their work literally within like two mile radius of their office. So anything that happens in Dumbo, like Aloy know it. And they, whenever any sites open up in the area, they jump at it. There's no chance for any of us uh, to snap them up. This is their Dumbo townhouses which is uh, you know, a pretty nice concept for houses. Um, they are very narrow uh, houses, they're like 18 feet, uh, but they have this mezzanine level. Um, so they're like four and a half stories, which is quite unusual to find these days. And the building envelope is clad in, in these uh, ductile concrete, uh, concrete panels, uh, which is a new concrete technology uh, which allows the concrete to be cast to like very delicate profiles. Like no plain thinking developer uh, would ever risk anything to use this technology just for the sake of making these fins out of concrete. Uh, but an architect developer can see that this would make it a very distinctive building. So it would make the project stand out in the neighborhood. So they went for it. Another nice project that Alloy has done is 180 Plymouth, 
where they torn down the interior of this warehouse and they built uh, lofts inside, leaving a large courtyard at the back, but within the carcass of the brick building. And uh, for this uh, building, everybody gets some outdoor space, which again is very rare in New York City. So the ground floor like gets that bottom backyard. The second floor has like this internal area, this internal terrace you can see. Uh, the third one has a, a, a long terrace along the uh, edge, and then the top floor has a roof and, and um, well, it has a double roof terrace and garden. Construction. So to talk about construction, I want to talk to you about DDG Partners. They are the Rolls Royce of architect developers. Like anybody that is looking to create an architecture and development firm, they always look at DDG as the role model. They have offices in New York City, Florida, and California. It was founded in 2009 by an architect, a developer, a lawyer, and a private equity investor. So pretty good combo of people. Uh, for the first couple of years, they just uh, started small. They were building houses and renovating them, selling them, moving to the next. Their breakthrough project was 41 Bond in 2011. And here, like, they put a lot of thought into it. All the apartments are double aspect. They have greenery on both sides. They use this blue stone that is native to New York. And they install these fully integrated planters. And when I say fully integrated, like the, the irrigation and the drainage is all integrated into the facade design. You know, it was really thought through. It wasn't just like a planter that you put on at the end of the project. And in this project, they were developer, architect, builder, interior designer, and property manager. They literally do everything, these guys, including construction. And why is that? Risk. Contractors can make or break a project. You need to have a good relationship with them. And this is hard to swallow sometimes because they're always going to try and cut corners. But as an architect developer, contractors really need to be on your side. You need to check their track record um, you know, for time and budget. What have they done before? You need to spread the risk. You need to make sure that they have a lot of uh, subcontractors, like a big network of subcontractors. Because uh, if they only have a few, like, you know, one of them goes bust, you're dead in the water. This is obvious. Um, DDG do very special buildings that are not easy to construct, especially now that they're so successful. This is, um, this is Shoko, which is, uh, it used to be a chocolate factory in Soho. They created this crazy, gaudy, Gaudi-esque uh, facade made out of aluminum sections that are cast aluminum uh, that look like knuckles. Um, I mean, even if this is not your cup of tea, you need to admire the ambition. Uh, DDG really pride themselves in the design process that they follow, and they always promote their buildings on the grounds of craft, you know, greenery and love of materials. Uh, and like we talked about before with the townhouses, the alloy townhouses, architect developers are more likely to consider in innovative and creative solutions, while traditional developers are going to go for you know, tried and tested solutions. This is uh, DDG's uh, latest adventure, which is 180 East 88. Is this crazy, crazy tower currently in construction in the Upper East Side in Manhattan? Um, they're using fair face concrete, stone, brass cladding. They bought the land for seventy million dollars, just just the land, but they're planning to sell for three hundred million. So you can work out the promote on that. Okay, so last thing I want to talk about is sales. Um, both Alloy and DDG partners get involved in their sales campaigns. Uh, this is 192 Water by Alloy. Um, they did this with a super low budget. They took a warehouse and they converted it with very simple materials. And before they started construction, they photographed the uh, warehouse and they put ads on journals and website and their website. 
um, showing these uh, mysterious spaces. And everybody wanted to know about it, like what it would look like, what is this all about? And then they began taking appointments, but they didn't have any money for, you know, to do a mobile apartment or a sales gallery. So they commissioned a graphic designer to paint the plans of each of the apartments on the floor, including the furniture. And it looks so cool. I wish I had more pictures of it. This is the finished building. You can start selling off, uh, so you can start selling off plan uh, as soon as you start construction. Um, you need to time it well. You don't want to be selling at the same time as a competitor, as, unless you have a very different product to theirs. And if you have one apartment that you know, is very special and you know is going to sell very quickly, you don't put it in the market. You, you save it for later. Um, thanks to the internet, you can sell yourself uh, residential property at least, like you know, just advertising through Google and other real estate websites. For other property types like office and retail, an agent may be better. And another thing to remember is not to get greedy. Like the most important thing is to sell out as soon as you can. Uh, and that's more important than making a higher profit. Uh, so have your target in mind. And if you can close a deal immediately, always do it. Um, in the same way that Aloy uh, posted the mysterious photos of the lofts to pike people's interest, DDG, uh, DDG Partners created a lot of hype with 345 meat packing. During construction, they covered the scaffold with a crazy Jajoy Kusama print, and that's her in the, in the 80s and today. And it made the building site look like this crazy box in the street. So everybody was so excited about it. What is that? What are they building there? You know, like, by the time the scaffold went down, it really didn't matter what the building looked like because everybody was just so excited to see what had been going on inside the crazy box. The building did turn out nice. Um, they used um, the Colomba brick, the Danish brick, and they ha it has very nice detailing. Integrated planting again, so did a good job. All right, last note. Know your value. Uh, the building industry is a business, so don't forget the contribution that you all make to this business. Great architecture has great economic returns, and good, good buildings always create value. Partner up with others. So pinch your nose, roll up your sleeves, get dirty, talk to men and women in finance, talk to lawyers, financial advisors, partner up with real estate agents, use their knowledge. And the third one is make a difference, like take charge and build something out of the ordinary. Do something that no plain thinking developer would build. Take advantage of, the, of new technology to create something special, special and run the show. It's gonna be so much more fun to design when you're in charge, I can't even tell you. So yeah. Go get your piece of the pie. Thank you.